Welcome back to the Dream Architect Life podcast. Uh, I have with me a really special guest that I have been really looking forward to this conversation for a while now. So today I have Jerome Myers, also known as Jay, who is the, a developer of people and places. He's the founder and chief inspiration officer, which you'll soon see this to be true, of Dreamcatchers and the Myers Development Group. Although he's often told that he makes investing look easy, the people closest to him know the road wasn't without challenges. So he created Myers Methods, a real estate education company to dispel many of the myths related to the industry and educate investors on his four-step process to owning and operating apartments. So that's his fancy formal introduction, uh, but we're going to get to know the heart of who Jerome is. Uh, Jerome, I'm so excited to have you here. Brittany, it's an honor. I'm glad to be able to spend some more time with you. We got to hang out last week and that was fun. You weren't the center of attention there, but I could see your <laughs> facial expressions and some of the other stuff going on. So I felt like what we were doing was resonating. It made me feel better about myself. <laughs> that is, that's so funny. Uh, for our listeners, uh, we actually, Jerome offered to kind of take us personally through his experience that he does for so many people. And, uh, the center of attention was Mr. Brian sweet. So it was really fun to sit and observe and watch you walk through that process, Jerome. And we'll, we'll get to that here on what exactly that was. I want to leave it as a little cliffhanger for our, our listeners and our audience here. Uh, so obviously I gave kind of high level bio and, and we all know what bios are. It's kind of the, the big accomplishments and all of that good stuff, but I want to hear a little bit more about your journey, your path, kind of where you came from and what got you to this point. <laughs> <laughs> I think it all starts with uh, me deciding to drop out of corporate America. I was, I was tired of laying people off. We built I was employee number two of the division. I started on January 13th and I, re I remember it like yesterday. And by September 30th of that year, we had 175 folks on my team. And by the end of the year, we'd done $20 million in revenue and had about a 30% profit margin. And for most people, that's pretty impressive. But I got a call at 455 on Christmas Eve and it went something like this. Hey, Jerome, yeah, we're gonna lay half of them off. I was like, mm, that's not the right answer. What do you mean? He's like, yeah, I know you and I have been going back and forth on this, but we don't have a place for him. We got to let him go. I said, yeah, we just made 30% profit. Like, that doesn't make sense. And we went back and forth. And then I finally got the Jerome. This is not a debate. I called mm -hmm. to inform you that a decision was made. And this is what we're going to do. Now, you can be a part of this or somebody can do it for you but I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. I'll talk to you in the new year. And my heart sank. And if anybody's ever had to deliver that news to folks, you get sweaty palms and a bunch of other things coming all over your body, whether the people deserved it or not. And for me, I knew a lot of the people who were going to be impacted didn't deserve it. And so I went and did all I could to figure out how to make this as a objective as possible. A lot of these things are subjective. Buddy, buddy, friends, they continue to have a role because you can't let your buddy down. And I was like, well, this is performance space and we're going to make it as clean and clear cut as possible. And so we got through the process and it was in that moment that I gave up all of my agency. I, I said that they made me do it. I accepted that the construct was doing what the construct does, which is handing down orders. And I said, I'll never do this again. But fast forward to two days before Thanksgiving the following year, and I'm having a conversation with my team and it goes something like, hey, I don't know what's gonna happen between now and the end of the year. You probably shouldn't spend all your money on Black Friday. Mm. And it was there, I was like, man, I just literally, lost all my credibility as a leader. And it was then that I decided I was gonna leave corporate America. And I, I went off and did some real estate stuff after, and that became very lonely. I, I was missing the development piece. And so I, I was like, how can I get back into it? And I knew that there were people who were working in jobs that 
they weren't passionate about. And I was like, I wonder if I can help them get out because I got myself out. And so we started helping people. We started doing some leadership development and financial services. We started coaching. We started doing a number of different things that actually got me back involved in the development of people to complement what we were doing from the real estate side. And that gave me a true sense of meaning. It gave me true fulfillment in the best way that I can describe it or imagine it. And, you know, that's what we've been working on, Brittany. And it's, it's really exciting. I was talking to a lady uh, this morning and we've been working with her for about eight months, maybe 10 months at this point. Yeah. 10 months at this point. And we track financials. We track revenue. If anybody's a business owner that we work with. And so we were looking at numbers because it's the beginning of the month. So we were looking back at the month of April and I looked at, I showed her the graph and I said, Hey, how'd you live off what you made last April? It seems a little lean. And she busted out laughing because she was so grateful that, you know, her revenue was twice what it was year over year. And, you know, that's the type of stuff that really excites me. I'm addicted to the dopamine hit that comes from people, yeah. well, from accomplishment. And it doesn't matter whether it's somebody else's or it's mine, I still get the same hit. And so what you guys are doing with Dream Architect and what we're doing with Dream Catchers, I just think it's a match made in heaven. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think what makes your story so inspiring, uh, one of the many reasons is that you kind of went from, let's just call it what it is, having to be the dream killer to being the dream maker. And I think that that recognition and knowing that you were called to a bigger purpose in general is, it's amazing. And that you actually leaned into that. So I think that's, uh, that's something to be so proud of, honestly. It's, it's exciting for me. And here's what I've learned. So we've got this really wild model. Um, and the first five layers of the six are connected to self actualization. And for everybody who gets actualized, get to the place where they actualize and they're making money and they're not worried about what they can or can't do because of the ability to be able to fund it. They think that the, it, they got it. They think that they've arrived, but the fulfillment piece is what everybody starts seeking after they figure out the money piece. And we just really love spending time there. And for me, I have just kind of dedicated my life to that point because mm -hmm. I know what it's like to have money, have this out of car, have the big house and not like myself. Yeah. Not feel like my life makes a difference. And I imagine some of the folks listening are asking those same questions. Like, what was it all for? Uh, what if there was more? And the answer is, well, if you don't do anything intentionally, it was all for nothing. And is there more? Yeah, absolutely. There is. You just have to be willing to take the steps to do that. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're so right. When you say that, you know, a lot of times we, by the time somebody engages with us at, at sweet financial, they've got the money part, right? Like they've, they've accumulated and they've saved and they've been diligent, but what people don't realize is that there's, there's so many decisions that they're faced with when it comes to retirement. And it's not just what you're retiring from, but it's, what am I going to retire to? So, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of push on this a little bit that, you know, Jerome, that, that process that we went through with Brian last week, um, kind of talking through what that, that whole entire scenario looks like, and how do you get to that core of fulfillment? Cause I think a lot of times, uh, when people think about fulfillment, they can just kind of be like, well, I don't, what does that mean? You know, how, where, how do you even find that? How do you figure that out going into this next chapter? So I think your process is such a great deep dive, but you make it comfortable. It doesn't feel woo woo per se. It doesn't feel awkward. I mean, just have a way of really having great conversations with people to help them kind of answer their own questions. So, yeah. you know, I, I have to pivot this way a little bit when you think about dreaming, cause you've had conversations with so many people around this, you know, really helping them get to the core of what drives them, what helps them make decisions. What do they need for this next chapter of their life? I want to put you on the spotlight a little bit and say, what does dreaming big mean to you? Yeah, it's a lot of different things. And 
what I've tried to boil it down to is, as you mentioned in the bio, developing people in places. And so it's my ambition to be the guy that the apex performers come to when they've got that thing going on mm -hmm. and they need wise counsel. I, I want to be the go-to for the folks that are moving the earl, the world, right? I was going to say earth and or world and I combined it and so earl, but it's <laughs> actually those, the, the people who make the world go round. And, you know, I heard Tony Robbins talk about this over a decade ago of, you know, presidents and this person and that high profile person reaching out to him. But the way that I think about it, my purpose, my space, how I know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing is if I'm in the first two phone calls, when something really bad happens in somebody's mm. life that I'm working with, right? Or if I'm in the first three phone calls for somebody that I'm working with and when something amazing happens, right? And so I want to be the person they turn to quickly when there's a problem and I want them to want to celebrate with me. If I'm doing those two things, then I know that I'm doing what I've been placed here to do very well. Mm. And, you know, I think it opens up. So on this podcast, up to this point, we've talked a, a ton about having the right people in your corner. And I think that, you know, oftentimes if people think about um, a business coach or a life coach or anything along those lines that may fit into that mold, what they don't always realize is there's amazing people out there that can be like your, your biggest accountability partner and your biggest advocate and your biggest cheerleader, uh, helping you kind of navigate the tough times and, and really, you know, take advantage of the good times too. Uh, so I'm, I'm so glad that you went down that path because I think the people that we put in our lives are, uh, absolutely monumental to our success or our lack of it. So can you talk just a little bit on that topic about, you know, what, it, what does it mean to you to put, kind of surround yourself with great people and how has that helped you in your life? Yeah, I, I love this question because I think most of us choose our network based on proximity. Oh yeah. It could just be somebody that's in the workplace. It could be somebody at church. It could be somebody at the grocery store, our next door neighbor. That's who we choose to spend our time with. We're not being intentional about spending time with people who are doing or have done the things that we want to do. And so when we don't do that, then we don't end up inspired. We don't feel compelled to live out our wildest dreams. You could go down the list. We just kind of acquiesce to what the folks around us are doing. I, I think the common uh, cliche of you become the five people you spend the most time with it's, it's accepted, but I don't think it's actually true. What I think is actually true is that we become what they expect. Mm. And so if you're around people who expect comfort, then you're going to level set to comfort. If you're around people who expect to work 60 or 80 hours a week, then you're going to match that because there's safety in the folks that being like the people that we surround ourselves with. And so I, back in 2010, stopped getting haircuts. And I love to share this story because I think it, it kind of illuminates this, a really important point. When I stopped getting haircuts, I got a couple of questions. Hey, Jerome, what's up with the crazy hair? Hey, uh, how long are you going to let it grow? Hey, da, 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 da. And then there was the, well, you're absolutely ruining your chance to ever grow your income anymore. Nobody's going to promote you if you grow your hair, so on and so on and so on. And what I found on the other side of making the decision was I was able to double, triple, quadruple my income, depending on what points of time you measure it against. I accepted me for me. And once I was okay with revealing that to the world, then those people who were interested in me came to me and those who weren't went away. And I was very, very, very okay with that. And so mm -hmm. we usually go to getting people to come to us. And what I prefer to do is, and this kind of ties back into our model, Brittany. So I appreciate you asking this really thoughtful question. So start with your self-image. Work on a relationship with yourself. Are you keeping the promises? Because then you can show up in the world in true authenticity. And then from there, 
you'll have the relationships that actually fuel you, ones that grow you, ones that inspire you. What I will also say about relationships is I think there's three different categories. The ones that are never going to be mutually beneficial. People just come to you to take from you. They see you as source. They think you can solve the problem. They think you can pay for things. Whatever the problem is, they think you can fix it for them. Then there's the people who you've taught you don't require anything of them. And so these relationships could be mutually beneficial, but because you didn't ask for anything, they're not mutually beneficial. And so you have to recalibrate or reset or renegotiate those relationships so that there's some give and take. And then there's those relationships that are already mutually beneficial. And those are the ones that we don't do anything with other than continue to enjoy and flourish those. A lot of times when people are selecting new friends or up leveling or being more intentional about how they spend their time, they get really uncomfortable about those relationships that are not mutually beneficial. They feel like they have to keep those. They feel locked in and beholden. I don't want to leave them behind. Yeah. So on and so on and so on. But the reality of the situation is those folks are anchors when you're trying to get your rocket ship off the launching pad. And so I, my, my entire, I, this last weekend, I, I shook hands with my first billionaire this weekend. We were at a baseball game together. It was one of the coolest experiences in my life. And I said, hey, what are you working on? What are you spending your time on? He said, well, mostly on the kids' foundations, but unfortunately, I'm trying to buy the Denver Broncos and it's taking a lot of my time. And the thought of somebody wanting to buy the Denver Broncos or in the process of buying the Denver Broncos is just mind blowing for me because it's like, that's not a conversation you have every day. Like <laughs> the normal conversation is, hey, I'm trying to coach my kids little league team, yeah. not I want to buy a professional sports team. So all of that mumbo jumbo to say, you're the only difference between your life today and the one that you'll have in five years is the books that you read and the people that you spend time with. Mm. What you put in you and who you allow to sow in you. Those are the only things that can change your life. And if you aren't intentional about those things, then you are being unintentional about achieving the life that you want to have. That is probably one of the best, if not the best ways that I've ever heard that just whole concept of proximity and the five people. I mean, Brian and I talk about that all the time about, you know, the five people you surround yourself with. And I think how you laid that out, I mean, anybody listening to this, I mean, I literally was playing scenarios in my head as you're explaining how we kind of fit into expectations. I have a hundred percent been guilty of that myself. And so I think if you're listening to this and you're relating back, taking into account what Jerome just explained and how you can apply that into your life and, and how you can maybe, um, break away from that a little bit more than what we do today. I think that alone, if you take nothing else from this conversation, which I know you're going to take a lot more, if you take nothing else, that's a huge monumental pivot in your life. Hey, it's Brittany here for a little tiny interruption. Uh, Brian and I have some really exciting news, and that is that our newest book, Dream Architecture, is official officially launched. It is live. We have been working for a really long time to bring you quality content. Uh, this is all centered around really similar topics to what we talk about on the podcast here, uh, but we're going even deeper. We're looking at where money and mindset meet so that you can focus on a life filled with possibility, a life filled with abundance, and one that creates true fulfillment for your future. So be sure to grab a copy. Uh, you can download it. If you've got a reader, if you've got a Kindle, uh, you can get your physical copy, go to amazon.com and look up dream architecture by yours truly Brittany Anderson and the wonderful Mr. Brian sweet. Uh, we look forward to hearing your commentary and your feedback uh, and really hope this can help you continue your focus on possibility. Now we'll get right back into the episode. Uh, so Jerome, with all these conversations that you've had and how many people you've helped, what is one area, uh, that you see people getting stuck? Oh, it's in 
realizing that they aren't good enough just because they showed up. Mm-hmm. That by and large is the thing that gets in most people's way. So I believe in the principles be do be do have. Be do have. You gotta become the person you need to be in order to do the stuff you need to do in order to have what you want. And so a lot of people think, oh well, if you accept me, then you have to accept me just as I am right now. And that's usually a cop out because they aren't willing to show up and become the best person that they can become. Yeah. Period. And so it's like, oh yeah, you just need to accept me. No, I, I need to accept the best version of you. Mm. I, I expect that I require that of you. And if you're not willing to do that, then I'm not willing to allow you to live at what I call a lower order. Right. It's more carnal. It's more primal. Like I, I believe that there is some magic in you. And if you're not willing to be the sorcerer in order to let that magic out into the world, then I don't know that I should spend that time with you because you're doing not only yourself a disservice, but you're doing the world a disservice. The world's counting on you to be all that you can be. Mm -hmm. There's somebody out there that needs you to do this thing that you were placed on this planet to do so that they can do their thing. And you could literally be sabotaging all of these people because you've decided to be selfish and they're like what do you mean Jerome? what do you 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 said i'm selfish absolutely right you're you're deciding to live below your capacity and what happens i think what happens in the life is there's you get the opportunity to meet that person you were supposed to be and if you look at that person and you start asking Hey, what, what happened in your experience? And you think about yours, you could end up pretty disappointed Mm. on the life that you could have had if you would have just done the things. And so be, do have, it's, I think it's in every religious text that's out there. And the being part is the most important piece. Mm. You actually have to be it. Yeah. That's, it, it's so good too. And, and, you know, it makes me think back to conversations that we've had. So, you know, we'll be in a conversation with, you know, be it a client or a prospective client or whatever. And, you know, hearing the terms I'm too old for blank, or it's too late for blank. And we're like, what do you mean? Like tomorrow you're going to be a day older, but if you don't at least give it a shot, you're never going to know. Uh, we had, uh, an event that we held and a gal spoke up and she's like, well, you know, there are a few things that I've wanted to do, but you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm way past that, that, that age. I'm like, well, can you turn around? Because I can't find the expiration sticker anywhere on you. <laughs> so we all know that we have one, but we don't know when it's going to be. So I, I think that is, you know, there's so much truth to what you're saying there. And I think that's so powerful. Um, so, you know, you're somebody that has helped people overcome fear. And this is something that we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast. Uh, we've talked about it in our, our books and I really would love for you to kind of press on a time where maybe you've been fearful, uh, something that you were really scared or intimidated by. How did you move through it? How did you overcome it? And what are some of the practices you put in place to help you navigate kind of what fear looks like for you? Okay. So you guys make sure people have great financial plans, right? Imagine a time where you walk out, you don't know how you're going to make income. You just know that you want to get away from these traumatic experiences. You think you have an idea, but when you go to the banks to get a loan for the first piece of property that you plan to buy so that you can create some income for yourself, they all the first one tells you no, the second one tells you no, the fifth one says no, seven, eight, nine say no, and number 10 says no as well. And you realize that what you thought you were going to do is not going to happen because you don't have the right network and you don't have enough money to do it on your own. And you decided that you were not going to go get a new job. So you can't go back on that. What do you do? Right? So that's what happened when I walked out of corporate America in 2016. And so you pivot, at least that's what I did. And I I pivoted until I figured out something. But, you know, I I had about a year's worth of savings that I planned to live off of. I wasn't going to go in and get any money out of my retirement. I wasn't going to 
go do this. I wasn't going to go do that. But I had them. I, I got it. I can figure it out in a year. And then what I didn't account for was, well, I need money to put in this property before I make money because I need to improve them. And, oh, well, that year starts dwindling down. And so how do you make money? And I think that's majority of people who would spend time uh, with a financial advisor. That's their worst fear, running out of money, running out of money. But I realized that there was something worse than running out of money. I realized that running out of time before actually fulfilling my purpose was worse. And what was the worst case scenario with me running out of money? Uh, go get another job. But if I didn't try, if I didn't see what could actually happen if I bet on myself, what was I going to do? I was always going to have that question of, well, what if, or could I, could I have? And I would rather, and this is not for everybody. They're comfortable. They, they've decided that it's good enough. It's not worth the risk. But I decided that on my deathbed, I didn't, I didn't want to ask, well, what if it would have happened? Or could it have happened? Or any of the other things that a lot of us use as a cop-out when we're trying to figure out whether we're going to play big hmm. and we, we also use the, the shackle, I'll call it a shackle, the shackle of, I got to provide for these people. I got a wife, I got kids, I got a husband. I'm the breadwinner. Yeah. But what if you turned it around and anything that you're using for fear can be turned around to be a reason why you have to. And I use an example from a buddy that I was with who buys wineries and hotel venues to turn them into wedding event centers. He, he has 10 children, six daughters. And when he was working, it was hard for him to make enough money to feed all those mouths. And so he went out on his own so that he could build a business where his income wasn't capped. And what I said is, you know, most people would say they couldn't because of all their responsibility, but you use that as a reason why you had to, and then you went and did it. And again, it's all in the story you tell yourself about whatever's going on in your life. These things are reasons why you can, or the reasons why you can't. Doesn't matter how you put them together. You're right. You're absolutely right. But what I encourage you to do is set it up in a way that the story serves you. It inspires you. It pushes you to go to that next level. Because if you use that, then you can't stop. And that's especially if you're fear motivated. Some folks are fear motivated. Others are pleasure motivated. I'm a pleasure seeker. I like the dopamine hit. That's my game. But those folks who are in fear, uh, you can use that fear to get you moving. Mm. Instead of holding you a hostage. Because fear can be a prison. Without question. Yeah. It, you know, you, there's this quote that keeps running through my head from, from all that you're talking about here. And it's from um, the great American businessman, Keith Cunningham. And I'm pretty sure you've probably read his book, The Road Less Stupid. But it, he, and he's most known for making a ton of money, losing all of it plus some, and then making it all back again. So in his, in his book, he talks about how hell on earth would be meeting the man or woman that you were meant to be. And if you think about that, and, and it's interesting, Jerome, because, you know, a lot of times in the people that, that we end up talking to, um, people tend to spend less than what their plan might allow versus overspending and running out. And a lot of times it comes from that scarcity mindset of, you know, being fearful of running out or, you know, should I really be doing this? Or am I too old for this? Or, you know, is my time maybe passed? Am I being too selfish? Am I, you know, all these, these kind of scarcity questions come up. And I think your message here about think about the time that you're on your deathbed. You know, I joked a little bit ago about no expiration date or sticker on us anywhere, but that time will come. And, sure. you know, if you choose to live a life of 
possibility and opportunity so that you don't have a death filled with regret. You know, that's, I just think there's so much to that. There's so much power and there's so much opportunity out there. Uh, so I, I love what you've said about that. And the example, I'm kind of chuckling to myself because the example of having 10 kids and building a business, I absolutely feel like I can never, ever talk about being stressed out, having three kids. <laughs> So I have immediately gotten that out of my vocabulary starting right now. Uh, so Jerome, another question for you, like you are what I would look at as a very optimistic, positive person. Um, I can relate that I'm not overly driven by fear. I'm more so driven by opportunity or by the pleasure or whatever, however you want to say that. Um, but I would guess that there's times where you can get down to just like I can. So what are ways that you either pull yourself out of kind of a negative slump or what are things that you do to help you stay positive and stay focused on the end game? Yeah, I am going to upset some folks, right? Here it is, Brittany. If you're down, you're being selfish. And the fastest way to get out of that is to go help somebody else. Because if you're helping somebody else, you can't be thinking about yourself. Period. And mm. that, that success of helping somebody else will make you feel better about whatever's going on in your life. There are people who would die for the problems that you have. The things mm. that you're complaining about, they wish that was their life. And you're going to mope and complain about whatever you're dealing with in this space. Now, I'm not telling you not to have feelings, but what I am telling you is you build a timer on that thing and then you need to get back to it because the only time good things happen is when you're in a space of gratitude and it may sound cliche but that's the reality there's so much abundance there's so much gratefulness in that space of gratitude i heard somebody uh explain the garden of adam and eve and i just thought it was so beautiful he was like god said that they could have fruit from any of the trees except for this one. So and the tree was in the center of the garden, right? So imagine there being, let's call it thousands of trees for the sake of being a little, I don't know, over the top, we'll call it thousands of trees. So you walk past a thousand trees and we're disappointed about the one tree that you couldn't pull something off of. You have to walk past all of your abundance to get to your lack of your scarcity every single time. And you can focus on that if you want to, but there's so much other good stuff going on. And if you need to compare to somebody else in order to feel better about yourself, I can't emphasize this enough. There are people who would die for the problems that you're complaining about. And I just use that in the space when I get down because I, I, I have been down. I, I, I've been depressed without actually going to a psychologist, right? I, I've thought about those things that you're not supposed to think about. The, well, they'd probably be better off if I wasn't here and all this other stuff that when you are in that space, in that place of being as selfish as you can possibly be because you're only thinking about you and how hard your life is, don't go there. Because you're, you're making up a story, it's mythology. It's not real. The thing that is real is that most people, the vast majority of people in your world are better off because they engage or interact with you. Hmm. Embrace that. And then go make that true for even more people. And I guarantee you, you'll live a life that you couldn't have anticipated. That is absolutely beautiful. And that analogy with Adam and Eve will absolutely stick with me forever. I mean, you can literally picture being in the garden of Eden and being like, well, I can't have from that one tree. Now I'm mad. There's no oh different gosh, than when so you got like a three-year-old and they don't care about that toy over there until somebody <laughs> else starts playing with it. Are you still three or are, are we going to be adults here and actually do the thing? Cause there's so many other things you can do. No oh question. my gosh. That is, it's so good. And I'm picturing in my head, a squabble my kids had, and I'm going to use this Adam and Eve thing for them too. Cause you're right about that toy. <laughs> 
So Jerome, uh, I would love for you to share, you know, we talk a lot about dreaming big and pursuing possibility. So what is something, a, a great ambition, a great dream that you have for your life and your future? Oh my gosh, where do I begin? You know, as, as shallow as it sounds, I want to make sure you, I heard you right. My dream and ambition for my life. For you, right? for, for, for number me, one. Brittany, I want a Lamborghini Aventador. As simple and silly as that sounds, right? Like I, I want a Lamborghini. Why do I want a Lamborghini? Because when I was eight, when I went to the Scholastic Book uh, Fair, I didn't go buy books. I bought posters and I bought <laughs> posters of cars. And I know for most people of financial services and the financially astute, vehicles are the most inefficient use of capital there. <laughs> but when I see the kid that I was see an exotic car and how it lights them up and how it makes them want to be more and how it makes them want to do more so that they can have the thing, as silly as it may sound, I want to perpetuate that. Mm. Because at the end of the day, I think our dream should be a reality. I, I think it's a part of who we are supposed to be. We're supposed to manifest and create these things. And we aren't doing that. In fact, we're doing everything we can not to do that mm. because we, we are taught that just fit in, just be good enough, just get across the finish line, just do enough. I want the extreme stuff. I, I, I want an extraordinary life and I want to be surrounded by extraordinary people while I live that life. Mm -hmm. And it's available for you too. Like, so why not? What was it all for if you can't actually enjoy it? Like a lot of us make money, we save money, and then we're scared to enjoy it. What was the point? Because the money doesn't really matter. The options that the money buys is all that I think any of us really care about. Now, some people do get really excited about the statement going up. I, I, I get it. <laughs> but is it just the statement growing up, going up? Are we just hoarding stuff? Or are we getting ready to have an experience that we couldn't have if we were in a different space? And yeah, I mean, as silly as that sounds, it's, it's a vehicle because I believe that you can inspire people without ever talking to them by just contributing that little thing at the right time for the right person. Hmm. You know, I have to say that I am so glad that you went with the direction of the car and not because it's just fun hearing that from those kind of things from people, but because, you know, I think about people that, that I've encountered in my own life and that our, our team at sweet has encountered. And, and you can think as the listener people you encounter, you know, so many of us come from some sort of humble beginning and it can be tough to lean into the things that you really want, especially on the material side. Like it can be easy to be like, well, I want to start a foundation and I want to do something that gives back, but really leaning into what you want and what that represents there should be no shame in it. And, you know, we want people to live in that aspect, aspect unapologetically. Like if you want this car, I mean, you've busted your behind. I hope you get that car. <laughs> and if you oh. think about like, and I think I have only known you for a short period of time, Jerome, but what that would represent in how many people you have served by being able to, to do something like that, that is a beautiful thing. And, you know, I would hope that, you know, the, that people would see that and see that for themselves too, and not feel like you have to sacrifice just because of what the outside might think or how that might come across. I say, you want that car, you go after it. Oh yeah. I mean, it's going to happen, right? It's just, for me, it's a matter of time, but here's the thing, right? I've done the other stuff. I, I, I have a fully endowed engineering scholarship at my alma mater. This weekend, I, I gave away $24,000 to a nonprofit. Like, I, those things are a part of the journey, right? Yeah. 
I still should be able to enjoy. And if, if you don't get to enjoy the money, what is it for? If, if it doesn't serve you, then what was the point in earning it all? Because I feel like you just become a slave to it again. Yeah. And maybe I don't get it, right? But I mean, I hear people, and it was funny, because one of the guys I spent time with this weekend, his net worth was a little over $11 million. And he basically said, if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, I've got this trailer in like Arizona or something like a single wide trailer that he added an extra bathroom onto that he can go live in for like, uh, it was like $130,000. And like, that is his, if everything falls apart, I won't have to sleep under a bridge plan. And to think about how many things would have to go wrong in order for him to be in a space where he had to live under a bridge. It just, it baffles me because we think a lot of times like when we have a job that that income is secure and it's going to come in the next two weeks and then the two weeks after that but when we actually amass and accumulate and create real wealth what are we doing it's uh, yeah I, I could go down the proverbial rabbit hole on this topic too because i think there's so many people that can that can relate to what you're saying and that have maybe, uh, not leaned fully into what they're capable of and what their own potential is. And I think to kind of summarize it too, is that, you know, there's so many people and, and I wish I had right in front of me, there's that, um, uh, it's like all the, the very famous people, people that are household names and when they actually hit perceived success, uh, when they actually, you know, found that thing that finally let them become an overnight success 40 years later, uh, you know, it's, it's never too late to start and it's never too late to pursue whatever's next for you. Uh, so Jerome, I have, I have one more question that I'm going to ask you, but before I do that, I want to make sure if, if people want to learn more about, you know, what you're doing here and, you know, the work that you're doing with people that are navigating that kind of next big chapter of life, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, the best place to go is jerome And there, I mean, you can pick which rabbit hole you want to go down, whether it's learning about multifamily investing or this conversation we've been having about creating the life of your wildest dreams tons and tons of giveaways and free information there. So Jerome Myers.co. Awesome. And we will make sure that is in the show notes. And I will say before I ask this question, uh, Jerome is a true giver and somebody who genuinely wants to help and is putting so much good out into the world. So I feel honored to know you, uh, Jerome, what haven't I asked you that I should have? I said it, but it wasn't pointed. And is Jerome, what's your thesis on life? And my thesis on life is your dream should be real. And if you made it to this point of the episode, you are now responsible for that. You can't pretend like you don't know that that's a reality. You can't pretend that uh, this isn't actually something that is relevant or appropriate. Your dreams should be real. It doesn't matter what they are. There, nobody else can tell you what they should be. But there's been this thing that's been planted on your heart. And you hear this voice every now and again, whispering in your ear, reminding you about it. And if you don't do something, eventually it will be taken from you. And what a tragedy would that be? I mean, it's, it's why I still chase the Lamborghinis that I decided I wanted, even though I never saw one except for on my posters when I was living in my little bedroom <laughs> in the house that my parents bought when I was like two or three months old. That is so beautiful. Jerome, I am forever grateful for this conversation. And, you know, I, I think that this is one that if you're listening and you're tuning into this, it's one you should listen to multiple times, because I fully believe that, you know, we listen to something the first time, then we get something out of it. And then our brains might be looking for something a little bit different the next time around. So uh, Jerome, thank you for taking your time. I understand time is the only commodity we can't get back. So thank you for taking your time with us. We greatly appreciate you. And we can't wait to share your message and your story and what you do with the rest of the world. 
Brittany, so grateful for the opportunity. I just look forward to deepening our relationship and doing more work together. Awesome. That wraps up today's episode of the Dream Architect Life podcast. We'll catch you right back here for the next episode.